We also had the opportunity to collaborate uh, through AbbVie support, um, an AbbVie supported effort um, across multiple institutions across the US and including an international effort, um, including our colleagues um, over at multiple institutions in Israel. We were able to band together and take a look at what are our patients, uh, how are our patients uh, with acute myeloid leukemia who are newly diagnosed, how are they doing when they receive the uh, venetoclax-based frontline combination therapy, either with hypomethylene agent or cetirabine? And we compared that to what other frontline regimens patient would have received otherwise. So we had a control cohort to start taking a look at how are patients responding, how are they doing, and is what we found in VLEA, which was a phase three trial, which confirmed the remission and survival benefit of azacitine plus venetoclax um, in the context of a clinical trial that led to um, its full approval. What we did here was we really wanted to confirm how are patients doing? Is Can we recapitulate what was seen in the trial? And I'll just sum up that, yes, we were able to see what was observed in trial, which was really exciting. That is not commonly expected. Um, very often, we can uh, have a biased patient or trial population um, or many other reasons that can lead to skewing of data. But we did see some consistency, um, which is great, but it was, you know, there's a few nuances. Um, one of the things that is different about uh, the cohorts that were included um, in the context of this analysis are that um, these were, they were randomly selected patients among those that we treated with venetoclax based regimens and the control cohort included patients that received uh, less intensive or intensive chemotherapy. Now, the reason why we had to do this, um, if, if you recall from the VLEA study, that was in particular meant for patients who could not get any intensive chemotherapy. They were either older, 75 and up, or they were uh, um, older but had a significant uh, clinical comorbidity that prevented them from being recommended for an intensive chemotherapy. That was the basis of ILEA. Older patient population cannot get a high, high dose regimen. And so the true comparator would essentially be an older or sicker patient cohort that could only receive you know, um, less intensive chemotherapy. Um, it was really difficult to identify a lot of patients like that, especially in the modern era, because as soon as the data started coming out as being positive from the phase 1B, it became increasingly difficult to offer patients substandard, substandard care. So what we did in order to have a true matched cohort in terms of patient number for analysis based on mutational risk and age um, and ELN risk is we had to expand the types of treatments that were included, and but we did look at the cohort separately. So overall, our intention um, through this matched effort um, is to look at a sample size over 500. And what we showed here was uh, the data from the first uh, just sub 300 patients, about 145 that received venetoclax based regimens, another 145 that received uh, standard chemotherapy. Um, we had matched patient populations with um, at least 38% uh, of the patients in both cohorts being 75 and older. So that matches the VLEA population. Um, over 80% had at least one comorbidity. Um, so that again matches the population VLEA, which tends to be a quote sicker population. Um, we included cohorts with uh, uh, that were um, untreated AML, um, either de novo or secondary. Um, and we made sure to uh, identify patients that had received prior therapy for mild dysplastic syndrome because those patients were not included in the VLEA trial. Um, we also um, looked at patients based on the uh, different risk groups, and we were able to make sure we have matched populations um, in both assessments. Um, and what we took a look at was representation of different poor risk mutations. You want to make sure that the cohorts match when you're doing an analysis. We did see that despite despite our greatest efforts to try to match the populations, there were some more, um, more frequency or um, increased frequency of having poor risk mutations in the venetoclax based cohort. That makes a lot of sense because this, these patients were accrued over the last couple of years in terms of this retrospective analysis. We tend to be less excited or enthusiastic about giving an intensive chemotherapy-based regimen for those with P53 as they tend to not respond. So many of those patients tend to receive a venetoclax based cohort regimen as standard of care. Um, we then also took a look at um, you know, responses uh, uh, 
um, and uh, survival. So in terms of the responses, which is, I think, the most important thing about uh, this uh, assessment is um, we found that the time of response was very similar to what would have been expected by LEA. It was either a one or two months. The biggest difference here is that this is standard. Um, this is following patients using approved therapy or standard of care. So in a clinical trial, you do bone marrow biopsies whenever the trial mandates. But in clinical practice, you do it when it makes sense, when it's going to impact treatment outcomes or treatment uh, administration. Um, and so um, for an older patient population, um, many physicians won't necessarily rush to doing a bone marrow biopsy right away unless they think it's going to be helpful. So we found that some patients receive their bone marrow biopsies at the end of cycle one and some um, at the end of cycle two. Um, but what was uh, really uh, remarkable is that when we took a look at the responses, the overall response uh, rate or the objective response rate was about 60% um, um, from those that were treat of vinyclax based regimens and about 51% for those that were not. Um, and among those that got vinyclax based regimens, the CR rate or true remission rate uh, with full count recovery uh, was nearly 40%, um, which is really incredible. When we took a look at the patients that got uh, low intensity therapy, because that would match the VILEA cohort, the um, patients and the low intensity control cohort had a CR rate of 14%, uh, which is really low. This is why we had the combination study. And for those that received um, the netoclax based regimen, uh, they, they had a uh, CR rate of 35%. So we were able to recapitulate the improved uh, response rate with combination therapy uh, compared to the approved regimens uh, at the time. When we took a look at the overall survival, we were able to see that at the one year mark, um, the overall survival uh, was about uh, 63% for those that were on venetoclax based regimens versus 49% for those with control, um, which was really encouraging. When we looked at the low intensity subgroup, which again matches the VILEA population, um, we see that the venetoclax based overall survival at one year is about 63%. And unfortunately, as expected for the control arm or those that pretty much received hypomethylene agent alone, the overall survival of 12 months was 34%. Um, and so we were really able to see that the data in VLA was indeed generalizable with AML patients treating the community setting. I think that is really powerful. Um, we were really encouraged by that. There are some phenomenal data sets that have already been published by single centers that are already um, in the literature and the data there looks really great. Uh, but this was one of the first larger multi-center efforts and international efforts Efforts to try to look, you know, you know, look at the same types of time points and response assessments um, across different patients from different diverse populations. And this was very encouraging.